We're going to go outside and uh, make the compost, and then, which is a construction turn. And then you're going to turn it, um, and if you want to see it really processed, you're going to have to turn it every day. Normally wouldn't do that. Um, the method that I teach is one that teaches you composting. Um, so it's a, a Berkeley method. Um, roughly, it's a Berkeley method. And um, it's at 18 days. Um, which means it's a fast aerobic heat. And um, when you constructed it, um, you've got your construction heat as day one, and then you leave it four days normally. And then you turn it, and that becomes, uh, this is construction day one, and this is day four. And then you turn it over again, two days later, that's day six. And then you turn it over again, and that's day eight. And then again, um, 10. And again, 12. And again, 14. Again, 16. And if you're really good, now you're at 18 and you're done. Um, that's the sequence. If you if everything goes to plan and you've got a good construction and you're keeping everything that you need to in order, um, it's not quite that simple because things can go wrong. But let's just say what you end up with at the end. Uh, you end up with a. Uh, now we realise dark brown is best, not black. I used to go dark. I used to go black just to show off. Um, but that's not the kind of showing off you need, because right? you can make it go black and super, super fine. But that's actually gone past the point where it's better. We now know because we're looking at microscopes, thanks to, thanks to Elaine Ingram mainly, that we've all got really scientific about this and it's become the cutting edge of biological agriculture. So it's dark brown. It's, um, it's got fines in it and chunks. Uh, it's not completely broken down at all fine. Um, if you look up compost in the dictionary, it says it's a colloid. C-O-L-L-O-I-D. So then you look up colloid, don't you, because you don't know what it is. <laughs> well, I did, anyway. <laughs> and, and it says it's a substance made up of particles smaller than 15 microns. Uh, it's very small particle size, 15 microns. Uh, soap, when water goes soapy, um, that's colloidal particles floating in the water. Uh, when water goes coloured with clay, those are colloidal clay particles. They're very fine. Actually, plastic is a colloid, but it's stuck together. It's made up of particles smaller than 15 microns. They're very small. So if you get this compost at the end, some of it's not compost, right? It's actually still chunks and it's compost feed still. But in between it are the fines, and if you rub your hands with it, it, it'll, it'll stick in the pores of your fingers, it'll stick in the palm, you know, the, the fine prints in your hand, and, and it's hard to get it out. You know, to wash your hands, but you rub it, it just sort of sticks. That's the colloidal material. That's really the compost, the super fines. That's the material. Um, <coughs> but it doesn't matter that some of it's chunks, because if you take it all the fines, you've got, potentially you've got everything broken down, and no feed left in there, really. And now the living system is going to starve unless you use it straight away in the field soil or get it out somewhere where it has an interaction with plants or, or break, breaking down organic matter. It has to go underneath mulch. It has to have a feed supply. It is an ecosystem. You, 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 you've organised, you've facilitated a, a, a very diverse and very numerous soil ecosystem by this process that's the best result you can get from compost that's that's as gardeners that's the best result you can get as farmers yeah so that's what you're really after um it's uh it's got a nice smell 
doesn't smell bad. In other words, it doesn't smell ugh. If anything that smells ugh, like that, anything that makes you jerk away from it, watch it. It's probably dangerous. You're, you're, you've got a very good smell reaction. This molecule's bouncing off a receptor right in front of your forebrain. It makes you react. When it's dangerous, you back away straight away. You try it smelling pure bleach. Go right up to it and give a big nose breath. And you're gonna, you're gonna, it's going to make you jerk back. Any rotting material that does that, be careful. It's probably dangerous for the soil. It's probably got pathogens in it. And it might even be dangerous for you. So your nose is pretty good like that. Um, it's um, just warm. Just got some warmth in it. Uh, and uh, it's fine. Uh, no, don't that one. It's the uh, same size. Or very close to the same size. So, uh, what we're actually doing is we're balancing. Um, Nitrogen to carbon. That's all we're actually doing. And then everything else is just added in extras. And and we always mark that nitrogen as one. Right? Because that's the explosive element. It's hard to hold the nitrogen. Nitrogen sort of oxidizes away from that. And it's hard to bond it up. Once you get the right combination of nitrogen to carbon, which is about like roughly 25 to 30 carbon, somewhere in there. Doesn't matter. You don't have to be super precise about this. We can gauge it in different ways. That's that's the mix where the nitrogen gets pulled right into it, and yet it's still you've still got availability to organisms in the soil, um, and it's not it's not reducing in volume, but it's not slow to release. So. You can you can crave away and try and find all kinds of uh, carbon carbon nitrogen ratio charts. Rodale do quite a few. There's quite a few online. Some of my students have got milkwood permaculture in Australia. They've got a compost calculator on their website and stuff. Let me just give you a little bit of an in on this, right? Because it's very obvious if you think about it. Um, if you want to do something like urine, urine is one to one. It's ridiculously strong. That's urine. If you want to do uh, something that's one part nitrogen to 500 parts carbon, that's wood. And, and to make you know this post here, because it's been alive, uh, as it's been alive, it can be composted. And then it's, if it's lived, it can live again. First rule of compost. You'd have to turn that into sawdust. You'd have to increase the surface area. Uh, sawdust means the, the smaller you make that piece of wood in surface parts, the larger the surface area is, then it might break down. So if we turn it into sawdust and sat it here in the room, we'd have to sit here for quite a long time for it to see it start to break down. We'd be sitting there a while because it's way, way over 25 parts to one or 30 parts to one. It's 500 parts carbon. It's a very small amount of nitrogen now. But if you want fish, fish, average fish, is about seven of them. So that's fish. You don't have to shred fish to make it break down. You know that, right? If I put a fish in the middle of the room here, we don't have to sit here very long to see something happen. Uh, and, and it would also smell. The sawdust won't smell of anything like the timber it's made of. It won't smell much. It won't smell noxious. And uh, urine will. We all going to take a pee on the floor. It's going to change the atmosphere. It's going to change in this room, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, we're going to go. Oh wow, that wasn't a good idea. If we want to, <laughs> if we want to cover the smell up, then we'd cover it with sawdust. There are loads of things out there that, are, like, there's an infinite number of things out there that are made out of once upon a time living material. I mean, I could look around this room. And, you know, this is a cotton shirt. It was once a plant. You know. There's woolen things here, they were once on sheep, you know, there's a straw hat there, there's the wood, there's the paper, it'll all break down. There's a, there's a dog, you know, there's animals, there's us, you know, but it'll all break down. 
It's all got different qualities, an infinite number of combinations, but you're, you're looking at, you know, what is the carbon nitrogen ratio? If it's if the carbon number is higher than this, it's going to be slow to break down. If it's lower than this, it's going to be fast to break down. Um, you can find some convenient elements that are high in nitrogen. So manures, like if you go um, eight to one, it is rabbit manure. It's very high. I will call it poo, right? Rabbit poo, and then like you know, ten to one. It is is chick is uh, pigeon. Not many people seem to have meat pigeons here. Um, and then twelve to one is chicken. And whole, uh well, cow is about sixteen to one. And um, eighteen to one is a uh, horse, which is a little bit more. Mellow. And then we go on and on, there's all kinds of things, there's just tons and tons of things everywhere. There's been a lot of hair, hair is high in protein and becomes nitrogen in the heat. And then it's high in protein, it usually becomes nitrogen very quickly in a compost heap. Those proteins get taken up by bacteria very quickly and convert. Most of the bacteria that we're dealing with are 90% nitrogen. But the bacteria in the soil is 90% nitrogen. That's why the, it's really nicely locked up in the, in the life in the soil. It can't leach away very easily. Where, where you know, if you've got nitrogen fertilizer, it's water soluble. It leaches really fast. It's a kind of volatile element. And nitrogen grows leaves. And leaves are the main thing we want to grow because leaves make mulch and convert carbons very quickly. And then all the other stuff can be bonded in. Like we've got potassium and we've got phosphates and we've got all the minerals in the soil chart. And they can all be combined into this process. But these are the, these are the ones. This is the explosion. This is the sponge. Carbon is your sponge. Carbon is your sponge. Carbon is your sponge. Every time, carbon is your sponge. You know, biological cleaning. It's carbon that's sponging it. Uh, taking out to toxins. It's carbon that's sponging it. Carbon is the element linked to the life system. So this is um, our, our combination here. Um, we can put an inoculant in there, so we can um, we can put an activator. Um, we can activate activators are uh, things that fire a compost heap. We don't have to. We don't have to, but we can put an activator right in the middle here somewhere. Um, and it can be so volatile, it can be a bit like weird when we turn it on the fourth day. Um, so you've got to watch it. There might be a lump or something really smelly coming through. And then it just breaks down very quickly. Uh, that can be an animal. Uh, or it can be a fish. Or it can be a good old compost as an activator. Uh, urine is an activator because it's so are nitrogen. Um, and uh, comfrey is an activator, and nettles are an activator, and I see you have nettles around here, and yarrow is an activator. Yeah, I use a squeeze test just to do this, so you, you just, you grab a handful, you can wear gloves if you don't like what you're grabbing. And you grab a handful of the compost and you squeeze really heavily. And I mean like, uh, like that. Really give it a squeeze. You know? And it should just drip. One drip. One. One drip. Or just sweat water at the bottom and look like it's going to drip, but not quite. That's okay. Somewhere close to one drip not two drips, that's too wet, and that means you're going to have to adjust things to make it dry a little bit more. Now, there's a, just a very basic, I like to teach this so you can do it all yourself, it's a very, very basic way of checking your moisture content. Not after a while, but you can just look at it, you don't have to do it, you can look at it and go, oh yeah, after you've done enough of them, you go look at it and go, oh yeah, that's a bit dry, that's a bit, that's a bit wet, you know, like you can just see it. But to start with, that's a pretty good test. Big handful, let's give it a really hard squeeze, see if we can make it sweat water at the bottom. Just drip one drip. I do not mean two drips. Okay, so, and then 
There's a heat test, so somewhere about here, it's either here, <coughs> there's a heat test here, or you want to test it. We've got a thermometer outside, I see, somewhere about here, 8 or 9, uh, 6 or 8, here we've got to hit a temperature. And, and then it, it should peak at about there and go down from there. So it's somewhere around first, second or third turn. Right. You're going to hit top temperature, and you've got to get up to a certain temperature. Now, we, we have to hit 50. Now, I'm going to go centigrade. Oh, um, Fahrenheit. All right, I'm going to do it. You convert it. Um, you've got to hit 50 for it to work at all. That's 50 centigrade. I think it's 140, 145 Fahrenheit. It's pretty hot. Yeah. And, and then, um, now we realize 55 to 65 is ideal. You can go right to 70 centigrade, that's too hot, but I used to do it just to show off. I used to think it was a good thing. It's not, a, it's better just hold it back. Now when you open it, when you open the heat, if you get this white fluffy thing all through it, I used to think it was good too. I used to think that was fungi, and I used to think, oh, I'm doing well. I was actually overheat. I was either too hot or a little bit too wet. That's an that's an anaerobic bacteria. It's the ver it's, nature's amazing. It gives you this quick indicator you've gone a little bit too wet or a little bit too hot. It's like a white powder. It's a fire blight. It's very clear that you. It, it shows you quite clearly. You're just. A, you are, I look at it and check. Is it is it just a fraction wet, or is it a fraction hot? Too hot. I have to just cool it down. So a, a quick test of heat though is that on those days if you if you've got your heat here you stick your hand in and you can get up to your elbow without saying ow right <laughs> then it's not hot enough it, it's quite uncomfortable to put your hand in to your elbow at 50 degrees. What do you say? It was 140? 122. Okay. What is that? 122. 122 for 50? Yeah. What's 70? 158. You're not going to put your hand in there. You're not. You're going to be very weird if you want to do that. You can't do it without grimacing. Your face is going to have an expression on it for sure. It's going to hurt. Like you're not going to get past your fingers on 70. You're probably not going to get halfway up your forearm even on 50 before you think, wow, that is hot. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. If that's hot water coming out of a shower, that's getting dangerous. In fact, most uh, um, building regulations in Australia say that you can't go over 60 degrees on hot water in a shower. You've got to have a, 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 a regulator on there, a tempering valve. We have to do that with our rocket stove, mass hot water heater. We have to have a tempering valve. Um, so that's somewhere in there. It's that hot. Now, you also need um, a minimum. Minimum. One meter cube. Of volume. Uh, that, that is that is one and a half meters high, which is about five foot. Yeah? yeah, one and a half meters. It's up to my elbow, uh, up to my armpit. It's about there. Like it's a gravity four part or about there. That's what you want to aim at. I use my wife because she's exactly 151 centimetres high. <laughs> I've got a lot of photographs with Nadia next to compost heaps. She <laughs> <laughs> double functions as a gauge for compost heaps. She doesn't like it, but she'll admit that because she's in all these places next to the heap. Like she fits exactly under my arm here. Um, if you go too big, it gets anaerobic because just simply because of the weight. So if you want to go bigger, you want to go longer, and just keep it that height and just go long. You'll see a lot of the commercial heaps that are good, they don't go higher, they just go longer. Um, just simply the weight of it is going to crush the air out of it, so it's getting too big. 
for a, for a real good uh, heap full of life. Um, if uh, if if it, if you get to here somewhere and it doesn't get hot, right? The first thing I'm going to ask you is, is it big enough? Because that's the first mistake people make. They try and make small heaps. Small heaps don't work. You can't cook the cake without the oven. Just not. You've got to have the volume. Uh, it's got to be big enough. Uh, go a little bit bigger to make sure the stuff. Just go a little bit more. Don't go under. A little bit more is okay. Three cubic meters when it's up like this, that's when it could catch fire. You get spontaneous combustion if they get too big. Um, so first thing I'm gonna ask you is, is it big enough? And then you say, if you say yes, it's big enough. Okay, next thing I'm gonna ask you is, well, how's the moisture? Is the moisture right? Is it that one drip or just a bit less? And you say, yes, the moisture's right. Okay, we well don't have to correct those two then. All right, the next thing I'm going to ask you is the carbon content. If you've got something like wood or something there, how big is it? How big is the carbon? The carbon's a bit that needs to have a large surface area. You've got regular chunks of things in there that are high in carbon and slow to break down. That might slow it down. You say, okay, that's okay. The carbon's okay. The water's okay. The size is okay. It can only be one thing. You haven't got enough nitrogen in there. There's not enough nitrogen in there. Can't be anything else. So you've got to bring up nitrogen content. It's something that's really easy if you can just go to the store and buy some blood and bone. <coughs> I mean, if you want to do it in the first world, it's easy. Just buy and buy some powdered blood and bone and put a little bit in on each turn, each, each pitch ball, and you bring the temperature straight up. It will come up really fast. You need something that's easy to add, sort of powdery. Padded manure would do it too. But something just to bring the, 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 the nitrogen content up and, and temperature will come with it. You just lost two days. It's like a game. You know, go back to start. You know, you just went two days over. Go on, you're going to go. Probably going to take you 24 or 30 days to make your first heat. And then once you've done it, you'll get it. You can come back in time quite quickly. Um, if you can be too, if you're going to be not hot enough, you've got to learn to edge sink everything. You've got to look, learn a lot about edges in patterns, but so edges in time, edges in temperature. Um, if it's too cold, it can be too hot. What does that look like? Or well, too hot's going to have that white stuff in it for a start. It's going to be smelly, it's going to smell like full on, and it's going to be dropping in volume quick. You're going to be losing volume quite rapidly. Um, it's going to be smelly, it's going to have the white stuff in it. You need to calm it down. You need to calm it down quick. And that means sawdust is a really good thing. I mean, sawdust is ever so easy to add and it builds the carbon content quickly. So you can calm it down with something that's high in carbon and nicely shredded and you just lost two days. Now, you, I could ask you, is it if it's not big enough? Well, you're just going to add a load of mixture and increase the, the size of the volume. But if it's what if it's too wet? So, oh, another problem that I, I didn't realize it's too wet. Um, for some reason, you've left it out in the rain, you didn't cover it. <coughs> Usually, it's not because you got it too wet at the beginning, so it's hard to wet it enough at the beginning. Usually, um, what you've got to do now is you've got to probably put a load of sticks down on the ground or branches so there's airflow underneath it and then you've got to uh, drive a, a chimney into it with the back of the pitchfork or something like that with the handle of the pitchfork and drive in a chimney um, so it, it can outgas off um, and it will help it dry. I usually get the pitchfork, turn it round, it's got a long handle, drive it, <coughs> rattle it around so you've got like a um, a hole right the way to the base, right the way to the stick, so the air can come through and come out. Um, can you use forms for your piles? No, I don't. You use I don't because I think anything that stops people stops things working. Now those are static piles over there that are cold piles, and they will lose volume considerably. Now look, there's 98 different ways to garden, and they all work if you've got a passion. Quote Bill Wallison. 
it's a radical statement. There's 98 different ways you can compost and they all work if you've got a passion. But if you are not a master composter, which you're not at the beginning, and they're rare to find people like myself, we're rare, I tell you, we are rare. And I certainly reckon they are, and I can to the test, they're often not. I may call my nursery mix with, poly, with compost, sieve compost. We have fantastic poly, uh, uh, nursery pollen soil because it's sieve compost with sharp river sand, all natural materials. I can make a project anywhere on earth with nursery. I can make my own nursery pollen soil. All I need is to find a river or a stream or a water flow, even a dry river. You get sharp sand on the inside bends of rivers. Every river, every water flow has sharp sand on the inside bends. That's where it deposits, constant. And it's gritty. When you put it in your hands and you rub it together, it's, it's different sizes, it's chunky. It's all the different rocks of the, of the catchment. That's great for aerating your potting mix. And the only other component you need is sieve compost. This compost is fine. Put it through a sieve, different grades of sieve if you want, and you just different proportions of sharp sand to to sip compost, you've got every type of pot mix you'll ever need. Nurseries are the incubators of projects. So I, I do it that way, it's hardcore, but that's the way I do it. I don't go and buy stuff from my nursery, I, I, I make it. Right? Um, and that's how I've done it in projects around the world. But if you make it difficult for people, that's the biggest hurdle you'll have. Real failures when it comes to permaculture because of our bad habits. We are very bad at being good at good habits. Staying habitual, just being regular, doing lots and lots of regular little jobs. We fail. I'm sorry, but we do. We, and first world's the worst. You've got third world old people that are cripples, they're great. You get mentally handicapped adults, they're great. You get even kids are better. And that's kind of weird, but it's true. Put anything in our way that makes it a bit more awkward, like that compost turn, tumbler out there, in theory that's the same system, but you can't see it, you can't touch it, you don't engage in it, it won't work. I bet you it won't work. Those, those, if you try putting this inside a wire cage, just that wire cage stops you doing it. That one extra bit of effort. Anything that makes it that you can't get to it and turn it. Like, so my advice to you is until you learn it, do it this way, get to learn it, let it teach you what's happening. You're touching it, you're feeling it, you're seeing it, you're engaged in it. It's, uh, okay, let's put it together. Construction is a job, right? It, it, the job gets easier because it's easier to turn as it goes, because it gets finer. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? Construction. One. A turn. Two. A turn. Three. Turn. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? Nine turns. Inclu including the construction being a turn. If you're fit, any of you fit young people should be able to do this. You won't have to go to the gym. You can do compost yoga. Long handle pitch ball, not a short one. Be careful with short ones in case they give you a bad back. Because the long handle, you can go like that. You can go this way or this way. And a rake, so you need a nail. It's dead simple what you need. You need a long handle pitch ball. It can be a three prong or a four or a five. Don't use a, any more than a five because you're starting to get to be like a muck, muck fork then. Three props, fine. Long handle and um, a nail rake. Good strong one, often with waves on it. Good strong nail rake. And the only other thing you need is a cover to go over the top with. Cover it up in case it gets too wet or here sometimes it will be too hot and dry. Maybe. That's it, pretty simple set of equipment. Be really tidy the way you cover it up, and you can turn it in 20 minutes. You've got to go for it, but you can turn it in 20 minutes. 
I've done so many I know. And what I've read guys at the farm right now, there's a team of guys and they're going, oh, we couldn't do it in 20 minutes, I'm sure. And I said, you try it then. And three of them turned uh, heat in 27 minutes, man, man hours. Like they added up how long it took them. You know, it took them like, you know, three of them, eight minutes, 40 seconds or something. You know, and they're like three South African, American, and an Aus Australian together working there at the Institute right now on an internship. And I said, they said, well, we couldn't do it. I said, well, you probably got in each other's way, didn't you? A little bit. You lost a couple of minutes. But you do it in 20, you do it in half an hour, easy. So it, it's, it's three hours work. Nine turns, 20 minutes, three hours. Even if it was four hours work, that's enough fertilizer to grow your, your vegetables for a year for one person. If you use deep mulch, include it in deep mulch gardening, that's enough to spread out a vegetable garden for one person, a vegetable garden for one year. That's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty damn good deal. Um, if you turn it every single day, this heap here, if you're here and you turn it every single day for the next 11 days, it'll be more or less done. It won't quite be as good because you won't get an initiator of the four days, but if you turn it every day, that will be 11 turns instead of nine, you'll do an extra two turns, you'll actually see most of it go through the process. If you photograph it every day, um, you'll see it change, you'll see the change happen. Exactly, you'll see it all change colour, you'll see it all go from fine, you'll, you'll feel it get hot, you'll go through the whole process. You can actually do it in that short amount of time. But what you have to do as well is you have to carefully turn it. If you're going to do it that accurately, what you do is you skin off the top two or three inches and put that there. Because <coughs> the party wasn't so hot on the outside because there's a party going on. It's a, a microorganism party with a diverse set of guests and they're really rocking on, right? It's actually quite a, a breedy party actually because they're all breeding, that's what the heat is. Right? And then this next layer there goes on there, the next layer goes on there, the next layer goes on there, and, the, and where the party was running super hot on the inside, they go to the outside. Right, so you, just roughly, you just skin the outside layer, you'll see it's a little bit drier, a little bit cooler. That goes to the middle, and the next one, next layer, and next and you reassemble back in layers from inside to outside. If you want to be really accurate and do it in a short amount of time, it, it, I'd drive you nuts if I was making compost with it. Because I get really pedantic about it. Like any chef in the kitchen, I'm going to get pretty moody about it and get it right. And I'll, I'll, I have a go at it. Because next minute they tell me it, does, it hasn't worked, you know, or you know, the meal didn't cook, or you know, it's not, you know, it's literally that, you know, don't leave a mess, like, clean it up, get all the fines, tidy, it's tidy. It is a very tidy process, it's a fussy, tidy process, you get fussy about it. If you read The Farmers for 40 Centuries, F.H. King documented Japan, Korea and China in the late 18th century, and they documented their villages, and they were really tidy villages because they composted every damn thing they could. They really swept up. They kept them very clean and tidy because everything that was organic was a potential value. So the most valuable thing in their compost was a hundred year old dirt floor out of a kitchen. Every hundred years they reset their dirt floors, their earth floors in their kitchen. They, they dug them out and reset them. And what they dug out, they used as inoculum in compost. Uh, if you imagine a hundred years of dropping stuff on the floor in the kitchen, there's some funky stuff going on down there. And they use that as, I mean, it's only your imagination would possibly think what was mineralized in that floor. Um, and you get a bit like that as a composter, because um, life is interesting, of course, life is lovely and it's great, growing around you, but you also start to look at how things decompose. So you start to look at how things rot. It gets very interested in decomposition. Like comfrey goes black when it rots. Things that are high in minerals or high in nitrogen go dark and furry. Things that are high in silica kind of go yellow and like shiny and long and, and sort of um, almost sharpish. Things that are high in, 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 in phosphates often go sort of brown and furry, brown and fibrous and furry. 
uh, palms. Palms are high in fog. You know what palm trunks are like when they break down, or palm fronds? Palms have mycelium fungal associates that harvest phosphate. They're phosphate harvesters. There's a few other plants out there that, that have mycelium fungal associates that harvest phosphates in deep rocks. And so they have phosphate accumulate, accumulate, accumulations in their, their bodies. So I'm a big fan of ice plant. Right. What you call ice plant? Carburetus? Carburetus edulis? Those gel ground covers, I really love those gel ground covers for food forests in dry climates. Um, any of those, they're really great soil builders, wonderful at building soil. That's what they're doing on your sand dunes, they're building soil. If you work with them, they're fascinating. They're, they're very good in, in dry lands where you have a lot of evaporation. Um, and you see some fancy ones around here. I saw some yesterday, some real neat, very small, um, Ornamental varieties, nice little flowers as well. Right, so, yeah. Material selection. So, kitchen scraps, do you give those to the chickens or, or the worms or you put them in your compost? Or, how do you balance that? What's your priority? Because your chickens, you have your new chicken tractor on steroids, you got to feed them. Yeah, well, you're making compost with that one. So, that's yeah. an assembly where they do an inoculant variation on you. Um, chickens don't really eat food scraps that much. There's some things they eat, but not all. And the farmer's wife used to get her pin money from eggs and chickens. It's called pin money. The farmer used to get the green geese on the commons. The farmer's wife used to look after the chickens and the hens. And what she would do then, in the olden times, right, was have a, a, a on the wood on the on the wood stove, she'd have uh, a, a big pot cooking mash. So peelings would go in there, and she would actually cook the peelings and the veggie scraps into a mash. Now, if you cook it as a mash, they eat the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Wow! Right. So that's and so if you've got a wood stove surplus running somewhere, and you've got a big pot running, you can cook it to a mash, and then you've got you know you've got a food they can eat. Um, so you want a garden and you need compost quickly, you know, you've got a choice. You can put it to your worm farm, you can put it to your chickens, or you can put it to your, uh, to your compost. But if your soil needs repairing fast, I'd go compost first. Because you're going to be there in 18 days like this and you're gardening. Right? You're away. The chickens won't really do that for you that, like, just like that. They won't organize. So why we've got a cage next to the chicken tractor on steroids is, you know, you've got their, 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 their mulch scraps that have been under their perches for a week, which is kind of inoculated, green, greenish material that they've inoculated with, with their manures. Then on top of that, you've got the cow manures, which has got organisms in it. You're bringing organisms to the equation, so that's the next layer. And on top of that is the scraps. They get what they can eat, and then they kind of start the initial mixing. And then the next stage is we assemble that as a heap and they desemble it. So that, that's a whole new thing. I would, I would move towards compost initially and then later on you're in phases of abundance where you've got worm farms, chickens, compost, everything's sort of like equalizing quite a lot. You know, you've got like your soil fertility is built up. You can relax a little bit. If you're going emergency surgery now and you want to move fast, then it, it, we've got to do something. I'd go compost. You know, they reckon if you know the bomb goes off or catastrophe happens, you've got nine meals in the supermarket. Um, actually, when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, they realised they only had two meals in the supermarket because the other seven were in the were in the, whip, were in the um, dumpster at the back of the restaurant because people go out to eat. They don't go to the supermarket much. So they found that the restaurants dump their food in the dumpster, so you actually had two meals in the supermarket and seven in the dumpster you have to go and fight for. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of people eat out in New York. <laughs> but if you've got nine meals in the supermarket, my advice to you is go and get them. Get your nine meals you're entitled to, because you're never going to be able to get them again. And bring them home and compost them. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you're never going to get that assembly of foreign material you're ever getting either. So you just get that inoculant in your system, right? And keep using that as your old compost inoculant. Because you've got rice from Taiwan and all kinds of things, you know, you've got crazy stuff from all over the world. That's just finished, right? So hold your inoculum together with those nine mils and don't eat it. It's not that that's good for you anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so what you'll find is it's pretty easy to get the nitrogen. Your veggie scraps, your, your vegetable scraps and your fruit scraps are about 25 to 1, 18 to 1, something like that. They're in the just lower side of this maybe. They're just maybe below 25. Depends, you know, you've got a variation of scraps. Got a lot of moisture in there, which is quite good. Weeds, green weeds, grass clippings uh, that are fresh are about 25 to 1. Um, look, you can make compost out of sawdust and chicken meat, 50 50. But it's really boring. I mean, it makes compost, but. Man, I'd rather put those peacock feathers in there. Mm -hmm. Some of that cotton wool. You know, like you know, like there's 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 pretty sexy ingredients you can put in the compost. <laughs> I mean you'll find some unusual stuff. Why would you just make it out of two ordinary materials? Like I don't see any reason to do that. But you can do it. You can make it out of really boring stuff, but that's not the idea. Now the nitrogen's quite, surprisingly, most people don't think this, the nitrogen's quite easy to find. It's not so hard. It's the, it's the, the shredded carbon that's hard to find. Right. Here, in parts of North America, in autumn, you get ridiculous amounts of leaves just piled up on the side of the road for you to go and pick up in bags. <laughs> I mean, you've seen it, haven't you? <laughs> it's like nuts. It's compost heaven. You just drive down the road, there's semi-trailer loads of stuff. And people just put stuff out. I mean, it, you have a, a lot. You need to find your sources of high carbon. Then you can you can you can make it more interesting. You know that 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 sawdust and chicken manure is like a boring sponge cake without any topping. It's like really not very interesting. I want to make a Christmas cake. I want to make a real fancy cake. You know and. So I can find these unusual ingredients. I just know where's my base carbon? Like, what am I going to get? Is my base carbon? If you're in Asia, often it's rice husks, you know, because there's loads of rice processing going. Nice, fine, high carbon, high silica material. Look for that. Look for your source of that stuff, because that'll keep as well. It'll just sit around somewhere. You know, I mean, there's lots of shredded wood on this side. There's lots of stuff that's come in because Joey's an arboreous. Um. Are you ever worried about like chemicals in going into your compost, like outside stuff? Say if you were to, I heard somebody composting soda, like pouring pop onto their compost. No, pot. I wouldn't be worried at all. So like, and then you were to put that on your garden. No, I wouldn't be worried mm -hmm. at all. Nothing like that. Uh, in Pops fact, you could pour it like a, 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 you got a little cup here of arsenic. Yeah. Right, and you pour that on. <laughs> right, and this experiment's been done. Right. I don't mean a big bucket, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, like there's a limit to what you can pour off. But you put a little bit of high toxin in here, at this end you can't find it. Because it's bonded onto the carbon molecule. So the carbon molecule is a cuboid. If you go back to your chemistry lessons, that's why they're so strong. So it's a cube like this. My so diamonds are made out of carbon and the hardest substance in the known universe. Now in this, and life is carbon based, so as you go through these billions of organisms, this is a thermonuclear explosion of life here, and you come along and kill millions of things. There's no such thing as a vegan compost, although I've made compost for vegans, with no manures and no animal components, and just, you know, I've composted seed. Night, I've composted bags of beans that have gone out of date. A compost, well, you can make a vegetarian compost, but in reality, if you get the microscope out, what you're doing is when you turn it over, you're killing millions of things. <laughs> and their bodies get eaten by other things, and then you kill them every turn, and they get eaten by other things, and then other things, and other things, and that's what's changing the material. It's lots and lots of dead bodies becoming lots of live bodies, becoming lots of dead bodies, becoming lots of live bodies, nine times. 
with heat and exposure. And at the end, it's only warm because it's refined bodies. It's, ref it's a refined diversity of life. Now, what's happened is that toxins become bonded to this, and then now it's now a long chain molecule. Mm. Once it becomes a long chain molecule, it's locked up. It's inert. It's not volatile anymore. It's sponged to the carbon. So it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust type of thing. We hear about persistent herbicide in commercial compost, compost though. Is that something if we're gathering from our neighbor's, you know, treated lawn, is that is that something that's going to affect us? Not in this process, because the volume is very small. If that lawn's, you know, I mean, I wouldn't try and make a compost heap out of completely sprayed dead material. Right. Like I said, oh, um, you know, we've just sprayed all these weeds. Would you like one ton of dead sprayed weeds? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> right? But if it's sprayed on a lawn that's killed some things, broadleaf weeds have been killed, but the lawn's still alive, yeah, I mean, we'll go for that. It'll probably lock up fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just use your judgment a little bit on that. And what will probably happen is if it's that bad, if there's a lot of pests on it, it probably won't compost properly. With worm farms, you do have to watch horse manure when they've just wormed the horses yesterday. And you get in the manure today. So you've got, you know, wormicides coming out of the manure. And for worms, that's obviously bad. And, and it's kind of interesting. It, it, there's hardly anything after six days. You might find a bit of meat and a bit of fur from a furry animal that you've broken down. And it, and it kind of looks like cooked ham or something with a bit of fur on it. You, you have to really look for it. And then in the end, you know, you might get the skull of a kangaroo stuck on your pitchfork or something <laughs> as it comes through. I've got those photos. And, and you don't see it coming because everything's got the same colour. Plastic looks more and more obvious every day because it's not changing. Mm. You've done that, have you? Yeah. Like if you've got yellow or red, it's just yeah. getting brighter every day. It's not getting brighter. Everything else is going the same colour. Mm. Now, I, I gave up trying to get plastic out at the beginning when I was getting a lot of fruit and veggie scraps from shops with a lot of black wrap in there, you know. I'd just wait till I got to the end and take it out when it's really easy and it's nowhere near as offensive at the end because all the slime and all that's been eaten by all these organisms. It's a real lesson in what we're actually doing out in the field, so actually. In a larger format, like a windrow or something like that, that you'd have to use like a machine to turn it. Um, do you still uh, you still want to strive for the inside out, or can you use like a forks, like a, a forklift or something to actually just uh, disturb the pile versus actually turning it inside out? It, it, it's like a lot of machinery is not going to do it as well as by hand unless right. it's a specialized machine. So these compost turners straddle the heat mm -hmm. and turn it both ways and water at the same time. But if you've, you've got a large heat, you're not going to have quite as good a heat at the end. It might not even matter. We have a four-way bucket on our tractor, we have a 50 horse tractor, and we'll turn a windrow over like that and turn it back again very crudely with a tractor and get a rough compost. But you're going to get a better quality doing it by hand because you'll fine, finally turn it, make sure every fork gets done by. Right. But you can. You don't need to get that fussy in the end as your system grows. Uh, at the end when you're left with that, that colloid, what, what is the actual colloid? Is that like dead, dead bugs and dead bacteria and stuff? Or? It's all those life cycles gone through. Right? Just, yeah. um, if, you, if you get, a, um, if you get a, a teaspoon of that stuff and you put it in a jar of water and you, just a teaspoon, you put it in a jam jar and now it, things have changed. We used to shake it for 10 minutes, but now it's, they've changed. They say, no, just rock it back and forwards for a couple of minutes. You're oxygenating the water enough that the organisms get knocked into the water without killing any. And the water goes dark. Then you take a pipette and pull it out. Pull out a pipette full of the dark water. Then with your pipette on a, on a microscope slide, you just get the smallest drop you can possibly get out of a pipette. And then you get a cover sheet, a little thin glass cover sheet, and slip it onto it. You can imagine how small that is. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny drop coming out of a pipette that's got, you know, a teaspoon of compost and a jam jar of water. And then you get on, on your microscope. You can't see anything until you get 200 times. At 400, you can see a good cross-section. At 600, you can see the bacteria reasonably clearly. 
that the fungi are so large they almost fill the screen. You, you, if you've used a microscope, you've got two tracking screws. One takes it directly left, one takes it directly back and forwards like that. They're like two tracking plates. If you just get on the side of the cover sheet and track across, looking through it, and today you can project it onto the screen. Because you've got a camera, a lot of microscopes have got a camera, and you can put it through your projector onto the screen. You can track across for two or three minutes going across that cover slide and every second you can see a thousand organisms. Wow. Every second. It feels like forever as you go across the thing. And that's just one track straight across the little cover sheet. And then, and then when you look back at the pipette, there's another 50 drops in the pipette. And then when you look at the jam jar, it's like there's a, there's a million drops in the jam jar. And then you look at the teaspoon and the cubic meter that's outside, it's like, oh no, it's just like, you couldn't imagine how many organisms are in there. It's bizarre. And so as you look close to them, they look like science fiction. So if you get a springtail, you know, nematode come through, it's like something out of Star Wars going past. I mean, you don't need science fiction when you start looking at this stuff. Wow. It's full on. Are they, uh, like, when they're in the, just in the compost pile, are they alive or dead or both? Or? Oh, no, they're alive. They're the intention alive. is that they're alive. Mm -hmm. you, you, the, the idea is you're nurturing an inoculum out to the soil. That's the, the, the top compost material. It's not just soil amendment or structure. It's actually alive. You're, this is biodynamics. Bio, life, dynamics. Dynamic life of the soil. Biodynamics, that's what it is. And so you're, you're, you're facilitating a more life-rich soil. That's, that. That's simply it. And, and if, you, if you're trying to make oxygenated compost tea, you've got to get them, they won't live in water unless the water's full of oxygen. And you've got to do that very carefully. And you've got to keep looking at the, the life in that oxygenated water. And when you spray it out, you can't send it out to a high-pressure pump because you didn't kill it. Really. You've got to send it out to a diaphragm pump and it can't be running too fast. And you really want big drops and you're, you're trying to put it on the soil and not the plants. There is some putting on plants advantage in some plants, like grapes. But, um, and, and Rudolf Steiner and Biodynamics said exactly that. If you listen to what Rudolf Steiner said in his lectures, they use witch hazel brooms and they fit large drops onto the soil. That's exactly what he was saying. And they oxygenated with a vortex. I mean, we can oxygenate with a bloody compressor, so what's the difference? You, know, you can do it more efficiently. Uh, I can take six litres of compost, six litres, something like this, of compost, and I can fertilise two acres of ground. Well, that's going to take 20 cubic metres normally. But I can oxygenate it and spray it on the right way so that a very small amount of compost can, can fertilise a very large amount of area with some of the new tech we've got. It's quite appropriate. Now, so your anaerobic piles, where they're not oxygenated, will break down. And it, and it can be, there, there, there's, there's lots of methods. So there's the indoor method, um, I'm going to take an, an anaerobic pile developed in India. Uh, this method is American, Berkeley, California. Right? We've got some heritage here again. Right? <laughs> developed in this state. Um, look, whenever you do a layered method, you've got to be a lot more accurate than people think. You've really got to be accurate. Because, and one of the troubles is you go like three months or six months, and if it doesn't work, it's very easy to get disillusioned and oh, crap. Did work, you know, like, well, I'll bother doing this again. Where if you do this one, it'll teach you how accurate you have to be, but it's infallible that will work. There's no question about that, that'll work. If you follow those instructions, it will work. And you'll see it, you'll feel it, it will teach you what's supposed to be going on. And 18 days is not too long. So if you go, by the time you get 18 days and you're nearly there, you think, wow, I'll go another, you know, it's not quite right, I'll go another two turns or three turns. And you'll be stoked by that. And then if you want to do some baseline testing, just put it on some, you know, put it out with mulch in soil, like put it like the deep mulch and columns of compost around where you plant seeds, where you, you know, where you're going to plant your seeds or your seedlings, 
And just compare the difference between that and no compost. And then it's extremely obvious. Very, very obvious. Because if it doesn't grow uh, vegetables, it doesn't grow your plants well, then th there's no point. You know, the, the thing with all of this stuff is uh, <laughs> the end result is what you want, right? So you've got a nurseryman who can't grow nursery plants. In the end, it becomes very obvious. You've got a gardener who can't produce food. There's something wrong. You know, you should be bringing in, you know, there should be wheelbarrows full of food coming in. You know, like, so it's, you know the results are very obvious. You can see the return for your work. We have a diary at our farm. I know, no, no one is allowed to pick in the field and eat. You can't pick off fruit trees. We try and stop you. It's something really hard to stop people doing, picking off fruit trees. My daughter's terrible. Like Latifa grabs it. She sits on my back. She grabs the fruit as it goes past. <laughs> she thinks, actually, fruit grows on trees. <laughs> it always has. <laughs> Milk comes out of a cow. You know, it's like <laughs> she didn't understand the other system yet. Yeah? Um, but... Everything goes in a book. We've got like, you know, like the, the, the log book. And it's like a big diary. Every day, the rain gets recorded, temperatures get recorded as well. But like the milk, the eggs, the meat, the vegetables, the fruit, the fish, everything goes in the book. And then it goes, gets weighed in and then goes back and then it goes through the kitchen. Every single thing. Because you can't see it coming in like a normal farm. It comes in every single day. And it comes in this great big mixture of stuff. It's completely different. And then we pay ourselves for that food. Because we are, Nadia and I are the farmers, and PRI are the not-for-profit. And we feed the people who come to the courses. So we get paid for the food. And so we have to account for it. And like we have, so we make a spreadsheet and we charge the, the, the not for profit, the charity, which is Permaculture Research Institute, say Tuna Farm is a for profit and it charges the, the not for profit for the food that it grows. And we only charge wholesale, wholesale organic price, we don't charge retail price. It's almost impossible for the tax man to come and actually do the accounting because he'd have to come every day and weigh a few tomatoes and weigh a few turnips and weigh a few. He's never going to be able to keep up with what we're doing. How could he? We're totally decentralised in our production and it's being consumed on the same property. He's welcome to come and weigh it in. That's all. For us. We'd be grateful for someone just to do the weighing in every day. <laughs> we need people to pick every day. If he wants to get that far, he can go out there and pick the damn stuff. <laughs> How do you avoid fire? Fire? Yeah, starting a fire. You mentioned that. Oh, I was going to say, we start four fires a day. In compost. In compost. Uh, fire lightning is something we have to light a bread oven, we have to light a wood stove, we have to light a you know, rocket stove, hot water system. Um, um, don't get too big. It's mainly size, we'll give it to you. As soon as you get close to 20 cubic metres in, in height, if you go to like one pile, three cubic metres high, it's right where it could catch fire from there on up. Even if it's... Even if it's Totally damp. I mean, it's in, with the right materials being extra damp, could make it catch fire. Really? Uh, uh, what they have to do in those big municipal heaps, where they've got excavators turning these massive piles, is they can't stop turning them. They've got to turn them all the time. But haystacks catch fire. I mean, you know, there's a traditional haystacks catching fire. So it's just so you've got, you know, you've got the wrong ingredient, wrong volume of ingredients to moisture at that point. Spontaneous combustion can just fire it off. Yeah. All right, so what we've got outside, to make it easy for you, is we've got um, a little bit over one cubic meter, I hope, and we've got one third, this is an easy mix now, one third manure, and it's a uh, basic manure, it looks like horse, and what I can see out there, we've got one third green, and the green material is often carrying organisms, so good organisms are coming with the green, so especially weeds. People in the books it says you can't use fish, you can't use animals, rubbish, right? And they also say you can't use weeds. They're saying we can't teach you to be good composters so you won't be able to kill the weed seed. 
that rubbish. So if you get to any of these temperatures here, you've killed all the weed seeds. Maybe tomato will come through, but not if you get too hot. Your weeds are often accumulators of deficiencies in your soil. They're often mineral accumulators. So it's like homeopathic to put weeds in there. Use the weeds of your garden in your heat, for sure. They're very valuable. But greens have often got organisms on them. Your green material often has organisms captured. So green and then one third brown. In other words, high carbon. Now we're just doing one third meter manure, one third meter green material, one third meter brown. We're gonna mix it together, get it wet, and make a pile. Go no animal to put in there. They might have, but I haven't seen one in there. Seaweeds can go in, anything from the ocean is going to have phosphate in it. Just be careful with seaweed that's fresh, not because it's got salt in it, because it's got gel in it. And if you like pile it too thickly, like kelp really thickly, it can go and erode it because it's just it's got a lot of gel. Uh, better off to dry it and shred it or cut it up a bit. It's not it's not anything to do with the salt. That's not a problem at all. And uh, the material itself's great, fantastic in um, component, but it's just the gel factor when it's fresh can be a bit too much if it's really thickly piled. Should you rinse it off or just I don't rinse it off at all. A little bit of salt's quite okay. Salt in the wind is a problem, real serious problem because it's cuddy. A little bit of salt water on the materials, okay. Probably quite good. Have a lot of mineral in it, like the minerals of you know the ocean are good, but you don't want to make it with salt water, but a little bit on the materials okay. So you're looking at an 18-day turnaround time for this technique. Uh, say you're wicked lazy and you're trying to stretch things out, so instead of making all the nutrients available within 18 days, you want it to become ripe, say within the next year. Uh, are you going to run into problems with things not coming together right? Do you want to manipulate your ratio of 1 to 25 to 30 to something a little, a little lesser? So you could just like create this pile, let it be. You know something, you're going to get to it later, but right now I just need to get this thing started so it can be. No, you could, you could just put it in a cage and just sit it there, exactly the same ratios. Just put it in a cage, sit it there. And leave it and the year's time will be about half the size and that'll be fine it'll be good should be fine if it doesn't get over wet or too dry you might have to manage the moisture content if you want to be slightly more accurate today you can buy for about three hundred dollars i think they'd be about the same here the compost thermometers the big ones oh you can get less than that big orange orange handle one you can get these fast acting tip, and you're like a doctor now. I can go at a compost heap like a doctor now, which I am, right? Is it? So if it's, if it's if it's cold in the middle and hotter on the outside, it's probably too wet. If it's hot in the middle and cold on the outside, it's probably too dry. As you go in, it's got a fast acting probe on it. It's got centigrade and Fahrenheit. Now, we're about three hundred dollars in Australia. Now, if you if you make a heap in a cage or one of these and you don't want to do guessing anymore you want, I want real accuracy now you probe it and it's between 55 and 65 leave it alone just leave it if it goes over 65 turn it if it goes under 55 turn it you're trying to hold it in there for as long as possible and actually Carl Hammer who I'd say is quite a compost eccentric genius He's holding his compost as close to 55 as he can, like 55 or 56, which is quite a skill. And you'll probably find you'll have to turn once every week or 10 days or six weeks or 60 days. And then it will just be done. And if you don't want to use it, you probably will have to feed it to keep it at top condition. You have to put some feed on top of it. Like, like, like alfalfa, shredded alfalfa. Now you can, you, you, that's what this is about in some ways. You hit top temperature and then taper off. But if you want to like go at the real accuracy, that's what we're all doing. 
we're all measuring with these thermometers now. Does that hold for your um, uh, method as well? In other words, if you take the temperature, yeah. you do not turn it bang on like 58 degrees? If you, if, you, if you want to be absolutely factually precise and you're holding it between 55 and 65, leave it alone. You get to the fourth day or sixth day, whatever. Well, if you, like, I, I teach you something where anybody can do this with no equipment, third world, can't read and write, you can still do this. That's how I like to teach. I don't care whether you've got a doctorate or you can't read or write. I just want to be able to teach anybody like that, right? So that's how I specialise my teaching. And I've taught a lot of pain work and all that sort of work. But if you want to be really precise, you're just going to try and hold it right in there. Gotcha. We know that now. We know that. It's not like we don't know this. We've seen it. We've got the microscope. Microscope, using microscopes no, no more difficult than using binoculars. You know, you're looking through binoculars seeing lots of different birds in a flock. You just look at a microscope and see lots of organisms in the compost. Not a lot different. There's bad guys and good guys, and you get to learn the difference a bit. You don't know everything, nobody does. But we know that that's where we get the best effect, and we hold it in there. If we hold it, if we can hold it in there, whatever you're doing, you're doing right now. Just let, let the That's where you've got the sophisticated party. This is the refined party here. <laughs> They're playing chamber music in this one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is not, not techno punk in here, right? This is <laughs> uh, this is orchestral music. So, <laughs> and if it, the longer it stays, the better it's going to be. It can't stay there forever. And to stimulate it is turning it, adding oxygen, and need a recharge. It's gone. The party's gone stale. Okay, hang some music. Oh. We're ready to go out and turn compost.